I'm going to cover um, HR positive breast cancer, which is uh, hormone responsive, hormone receptor positive uh, breast cancer, um, also known as ERPR positive breast cancer. Um, as Janine mentioned, I'm not going to talk about triple positive breast cancer, which is ERPR and HER2 new positive breast cancer. And so again, I think if if you do have triple positive or that is what you want to learn about primarily, um, there might be another session going for that. Okay, so just a brief outline of, of how I'm going to approach it. I'm actually going to start at the beginning. I'm going to begin at the beginning <laughs> and talk about um, types of breast cancer, the different types, because really the different types of breast cancer inform how each type is treated. Um, then I'll focus in on the HR positive breast cancer and what the treatment strategies are there, um, the way that different pathways um, are targeted in hormone responsive breast cancer, which means uh, it's all about blocking um, the hormone signaling, which we're going to get into. Um, we'll talk about treatment and then um, some take home points that I hope kind of give you a summary um, and bring everything together. Those are my like if you don't remember anything else that I said points, just remember these. So those will come at the end. Uh, so hopefully you'll remember those points right at the end. All right, so again, I'm gonna start at the beginning because I think when we start to talk about how we treat cancer and breast cancer and all the different types, it can get very complicated very quickly. Um, and really, it, it all comes down to, you know, having a cell that is growing out of control and finding ways to stop that growth. That is the whole story, right? And so whenever it gets a little bit overwhelming to think about pathways and resistance and how many drugs are we putting together at the end of the day is all about how do we stop this cell from growing out of control? Okay, so um, a tumor starts from a single cancer cell, in this case, in the breast. Um, the cancer cell then can invade nearby tissues, then getting into um, lymph nodes. And then once the cancer cell uh, gets into lymph nodes is where it can then access other parts of the body um, and spread outside of that breast and those lymph nodes that are near the breast getting to other parts of the body um, and causing metastatic disease where now there's cancer um, in distant parts, other organs, et cetera. This also actually corresponds to staging. And I know this is a metastatic um, cancer conference, but you know might be familiar with the stages of breast cancer, one being the earliest stage, um, two and three being larger tumors where the nodes are involved, and then stage four, with metastatic disease. So what are the different types of breast cancer? So when there's a new cancer diagnosis, what we need to know in terms of pathology is um, three receptors. And if those receptors are found in that particular cancer or not. And those three are the estrogen receptor, which is ER, the progesterone receptor, which is PR, and then HER2 nu. Um, and within those three, we can have different combinations of whether a particular tumor has that receptor or doesn't. Um, and then here, here are all the different types, right? So I mentioned at the beginning um, that there's triple positive and so did Janine. So that is ER, PR positive and HER2 new positive, meaning all three receptors are expressed. So that is a triple positive cancer. What we'll talk about here ERPR positive HER2 negative cancer, uh, which is also called HR positive cancer, hormone receptor positive. Um, you can also have ERPR negative and HER2 new positive cancers. And then you can have a cancer which is negative for all three receptors. And that's commonly called a triple negative breast cancer, which means all three receptors are negative. Why this is important is that really, it underpins um, how we treat the different cancers, but it also gives us something to expect in terms of relapse patterns of the cancer, which organs um, the cancer might spread to depending on the different types, and then what we can expect about the treatment course. 
um, how long we can expect uh, for a certain treatment to work, where we think that the cancer will go, et cetera. So very important in terms of um, kind of laying a roadmap of what is most common based on these types of cancers, and then also how we would treat and target those cancers. So you heard um, before, I think, that the ERPR positive uh, subtype is the most common cancer, and it is. It accounts for about 60% um, of breast cancers that are diagnosed. Then the triple negatives account for about 20%. And then the HER2 positives with different variations of whether they um, also express hormone receptor positive or not um, account for the remainder. So the ERPR positive HER2 negative subset that we're talking about today um, is the most common. So when we start to think about breast cancer treatments, um, Broadly, there are different uh, modalities that we use to treat cancers. And so uh, surgery and radiation are two that are mostly used in earlier stages, but can also be used um, in later stages for symptom control, for example. Um, chemotherapy and targeted therapy is really uh, where we, um, where how we manage stage four metastatic disease. But Chemotherapy and targeted therapy are different. Um, th we will talk about how they're different next. So here's what, what's important to remember about chemotherapy versus what we're gonna call targeted therapy. So chemotherapy kills growing cells indiscriminately and no one worry, I have a lot of these kind of pictures um, with pathways and cell cycles and I promise I'm not going to go through these in detail. They are just pictures um, to illustrate the point and to help me remember what I want to say on the slide, to be honest. But um, and this one reminds me to say that chemotherapy uh, kills all growing cells indiscriminately. And so it is very good at killing um, actively dividing cancer cells. It is also very good at killing actively dividing not cancer cells. So um, your Healthy cells, um, which are actively growing, are also killed by chemotherapy. That is um, the side effects that we get from chemotherapy, you know, in the gastrointestinal tract, nausea, vomiting, um, in the hair follicles with hair loss, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> that's why you kind of get this across the board, um, you know, different side effects which um, affect different parts of the body, lots of different systems. Um, chemotherapy is very good <laughs> um, at doing this. Targeted therapy, on the other hand, um, is like the name would suggest, targeted to certain pathways that are um, actively driving that cancer cell. And so what targeted therapies can do is um, kill that actively dividing cancer cell while sparing um, your normal uh, healthy body cells. And so that's why as you learn more or hear more or you're treated with um, you know, targeted therapies and chemotherapies, you'll learn that the side effect profiles are very different. Um, the targeted therapies in general tend to be um, better tolerated overall um, because of this um, concept that they are specific to cancer cells while sparing your healthy body cells. So what are some of the targeted therapies for breast cancer? Again, I promise I am gonna be specific to HR positive breast cancer, I think after the next slide, but <laughs> I wanted to um, start off because um, a lot of times, if especially if you're newly diagnosed, you might hear a lot of um, these drug names, um, you know, if you start to read um, or you know other people who have gone through breast cancer. And so often, um, you know, people have questions of like, why aren't I getting Herceptin? Or why aren't I getting, you know, um, another drug that I heard about, Progetta? So just wanted to give a sense of, um, you know, the other drugs for kind of other types of breast cancer in case you hear about them, um, you understand um, what's in play for an ERPR positive, HER2 negative breast cancer versus others. The other reason I wanted to talk about this is because 
over the course of treatment um, for an HR positive breast cancer, um, sometimes as you get, you know, years into being treated, you might have another biopsy at some point and your biopsy might actually show a different um, result, a different receptor result. And then um, drugs which were not in your initial plan might become in your uh, subsequent plan. So um, for the HER2 positive breast cancers, there are drugs called like Herceptin, Progetta, Ketsyla, which are targeted um, to that HR receptor that I talked about uh, in the first slide. Um, for the triple negative breast cancers right now, that's where the immunotherapy comes into play. So you might hear um, a lot about immunotherapy um, around, across cancer types and then um, specifically in breast cancer. Um, some of the, the types are pembrolizumab, which actually um, is out of favor now for tezolizumab in triple negative breast cancer. Um, and then Tradelvi is another triple negative um, specific uh, treatment. Um, for the BRCA mutated cancers, there are uh, PARP inhibitors. You might hear the name Olaparib or Limparza or Telzena, which is Telozaparib. Um, and so just to keep those in mind, if you have a BRCA mutation and an HR positive breast cancer, um, actually using a PARP inhibitor may be in your treatment plan as well. And now the reason we're here, let's talk about specifically HR positive um, endocrine therapies and resistance pathways um, and how those play into uh, the way that we approach treatment for an HR positive breast cancer. All right, so two important things to know about treating this type of breast cancer. There are two pathways that um, are kind of the foundation for everything. So the first, not surprisingly, um, is the estrogen receptor pathway. And so what that means is that these types of breast cancers get a signal from estrogen when it binds uh, to that receptor, it goes into the cell and gives the cell um, a message to grow. And so all of this is here uh, just to say that. So the foundation of treating this type of breast cancer is that it's all about blocking that signal that the cancer cell would receive from estrogen. And there are different ways to do that. Uh, some of the drugs that we're going to talk about that you may be on or have heard of, or you will be on, um, tamoxifen, Arimidex, Fosladex, Aromacin, hopefully um, some of these uh, names are ringing a bell. Um, or they or they will be familiar to you uh, as you go down your um, treatment course. So first thing to keep in mind, it's all about blocking uh, the effects of estrogen in the cancer cell. And the second thing to keep in mind is it's also all about where you are in terms of menopause. And so the reason this is important is because the way your body makes estrogen to give that signal to the cancer cell to grow is different depending on if you are premenopausal, haven't gone through menopause, or um, postmenopausal. And um, this is an important part to make. Um, on this slide, uh, I'll just I will go through this just briefly, and that is before menopause, um, estrogen comes from the ovaries. Okay, but after menopause, actually, it's made from a precursor uh, from the adrenal glands, which sits on top of the kidney. Um, and that precursor then goes uh, through some changes from enzymes that live in fat tissue. And that enzyme is called aromatase. And so those drugs, um, Femara, Aromacin, um, are, are aromatase inhibitors. And it means that it blocks this enzyme. And so the precursor, which leads to estrogen, gets blocked so that uh, the estrogen isn't made. Um, and so that is how it, um, that's how it works. <laughs> and that is why the aromatase inhibitors are uh, for postmenopausal women um, only. The, um, the, the interesting thing to note about this is because of the way hormones work in the body and feedback, um, when we, if we were to give uh, treatments for postmenopausal women to women who are not menopausal, who are premenopausal, it can actually cause the ovaries to jump into action and produce even more estrogen than they were before. 
right? And so whenever we think about, you know, if you're a premenopausal woman or know someone who is or supporting someone who is, um, when treatment plans are discussed, there's going to be a discussion around, you know, possibly um, inducing menopause to block um, this estrogen production from the ovaries. So I hope that makes sense. And also, just as an editorial note, I wasn't a huge fan of like the postmenopausal woman being depicted this way, but I thought they were just trying to make the point that the aromatase comes from fat cells, but that's just an editorial point. Okay, next slide. All right, and so having said that, right, keeping in mind that the two foundations here are cutting off estrogen and then being mindful to how estrogen is made in a particular person's body. Um, then here are the foundational drugs uh, that will be used in term when, um, when we're planning treatment for a patient. And so first, let's start with premenopausal women. And so these are blockers which would induce menopause in a premenopausal woman. Um, these are injections and um, names, common names, Lupron and Zolodex. Um, in premenopausal women, tamoxifen um, acts on estrogen uh, receptors in premenopausal women. And so that is a foundation for premenopausal women who are not um, on one of these to put them into menopause. And then the last two are for postmenopausal women. And we touched on this in the last slide, and that is uh, aromatase inhibitors. And we talked about how those work and why those are for postmenopausal women. And so common, the names here are Remedex, Femara, and Aromacin. Um, and then Fosladex, which is um, essentially an estrogen receptor blocker, actually um, degrades estrogen receptor. Um, again, for postmenopausal women, because uh, premenopausal women can make enough estrogen right, to overcome this. And so these two categories can be used in premenopausal women if they're also um, put into menopause, essentially. Okay, so now that we have those, that basis in mind, right, of how are we gonna block estrogen and is the woman premenopausal or postmenopausal, um, there's something else to talk about. And that is that cancer cells um, are very good at escaping um, what we do with drugs to kill them off, right? And so this is an example of a pathway um, which is um, dictated by uh, cyclins called CD4 and CD6. Um, and essentially it is a way for um, the cancer cells to live on <laughs> despite uh, blocking what we're doing with the drugs. And so um, thankfully there is a class of drugs called CD4-6 inhibitors, um, which can be given in combination with these hormonal therapies and greatly improves outcomes um, in metastatic uh, HR positive breast cancer patients. And so, um, you know, once we have that, the foundation, I'm now going to throw a curveball. Um, and that is that because of um, how well the CD4-6 inhibitors work, the way that we treat breast cancer now is block the estrogen, consider the menopausal status, and consider a CDK inhibitor. And actually, this is now um, standard of care. Um, in combination. So CDK46 uh, inhibitors, those names that you may heard or you will hear of Ibrance, uh, Kizkali, and Virginio. Um, you know, this is really, um, um, really a success for me and um, something that I kind of sit back and, you know, think about every now and then, and that is how much cancer treatment changes and how fast it changes um, and the advances that we're making. Because when I started um, training in fellowship to treat um, breast cancer patients, we weren't using these drugs. We, we weren't using CDK inhibitors. Um, 
And when the trial started, it was actually uh, proving uh, that these worked in patients, you know, after they had failed, like first line. Now we use these up front um, when a patient is, you know, even newly diagnosed and it, it is really changed um, uh, the disease treatment um, and trajectory. And so it is really um, fascinating for me to sit back every now and then and just kind of think about how things have changed um, in the relatively short time that I've been um, involved in the care of patients. So again, when you're facing um, a new diagnosis, just to remember, um, you know, what the, the names that will come up will uh, will be determined by how we're gonna block estrogen, if you're premenopausal or postmenopausal, and then um, resistance pathways. Oops. Okay, so I mentioned that cancer cells are smart and that is what makes it um, you know, challenging um, to treat, right? Um, so another, pathway that has been uh, discovered by researchers and is now targeted um, is for patients who now have had, you know, endocrine therapy, um, in some cases have had the um, CD4-6 inhibitors, and then the cancer is quiet for usually a, a long time and then uh, can start to grow again. And so what was discovered is that Again, there are other pathways, right, that evolve. Um, and one is called, uh, one is dictated by something called PIK3CA. And there is a drug which now targets that pathway. So a few things to know about PIK3CA. Um, first of all, it's about 40% of HR positive breast cancer. So that is, um, that's a pretty good percentage, actually. Um, it won't be all. There has to be a test that shows whether or not, you know, a particular breast cancer has what's called a PIK3CA mutation. Um, but about 40% of the time it will. And in the cancers that do have a PIK3CA mutation, uh, PIKRA is available now in combination uh, with endocrine therapies. It's used after you, um, have had at least a line of therapy, at least one line of therapy. So it wouldn't be the first choice, but it's definitely in the arsenal um, for those patients that have this particular um, mutation. So something else that might come up um, in terms of treatment. Um, another you know, targeted agent that can be used after sort of the first line is a drug called Infinitor, Affinitor. Um, and it works by inhibiting something called mTOR, also given in combination with other endocrine therapies. Um, you know, also available after your first kind of treatment. So those are two other therapies that, you know, to be familiar with that you may be treated with and may come up. Okay. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the on this slide because this is you know what what I would like for you to take away and I hope it's helpful and useful um, as you um, you know go into your doctor's offices and hear what the treatments are going to be for you or for your family member if that's the case that again everything is um, around how we turn off the signal of estrogen, and then how we can control those resistance pathways that we know um, will come up. You should expect that there, this is going to require a combination. Um, and now I hope you, know, you have a little bit of insight as to why that is. Um, the thing about ERPR positive, uh, HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer to know though, is that um, it can be managed uh, for long amounts of time with just these endocrine maneuvers, right? And um, barring, you know, needing an injection 
for induction of menopause, um, often these are oral agents um, and we can um, achieve disease um, control for you know long amounts of time with these with these agents. Um, again, a different side effect profile um, than chemotherapy uh, because they are targeted. But um, just to understand that sometimes chemotherapy is used um, in the management of this type of breast cancer. Um, certain situations where chemotherapy could be um, used is um, if there is a need to get fast control of a tumor because of involvement in um, a critical organ, like the lungs, for example, or the liver, uh, then chemotherapy would be used first, um, and then endocrine therapies would be used. Um, the other thing is that, you know, at some point, uh, often the tumors can become uh, resistant to the endocrine maneuvers and um, the other drugs which are targeted to resistance pathways. And then at that point, chemotherapy is the remaining um, option. Um, I think what is um, important to remember though, is that with this type of breast cancer, there are many options you know, um, in terms of treatment um, in addition to uh, chemotherapy. So um, just to keep in mind that you may also hear about chemotherapy uh, in the management. Um, you know, research is always so important. And so I just want to take a minute to kind of talk about where the research is going and then encourage clinical trial participation. Um, and I guess I'll start with the last bullet first. Uh, the reason I, you know, um, encourage clinical trial participation is I kind of touched on it already. And that is that, uh, you know, I've seen um, the treatment of breast cancer change so much in just 10 years. And that is, um, or a little bit over 10 years, but that is um, solely because of clinical trials and the patients who participate. Because if patients don't participate, trials don't get done. Um, and we, we don't move the, we don't move the, the field forward. Um, and so, you know, really just want to encourage that. Um, want to encourage you that if you are um, offered a trial um, to, you know, ask about it, think about it, consider it, um, and understand what it is that they're, they're offering you if that comes up. Um, active areas of research right now um, are really, there was a, a trial that was recently reported with um, an oral medication that works like Posidex. Fosladex is, a, um, is an injection, um, but this would be an oral medication. Um, there are also trials um, that are looking at some therapies which are used right now for um, triple negative breast cancer because of um, an antibody called trope 2 that they're also looking at um, an ER positive breast cancer. And so um, there's still, you know, a lot of exciting trials um, in the pipeline for this type of breast cancer. And, you know, I would encourage you to consider those uh, if you're offered. And that is it. Hi, Thank Janine. You. Hi. <laughs> Are you coming back? I hope I'm not by myself now. Okay. Yes, I, I have not left you. Thank you so much, Dr. Avery. That was a great... Um, introduction to all the different pieces that we can talk about. And we already have lots and lots of questions. So I'm going to okay. just go ahead um, and start asking some questions. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so my first question is from someone who is asking, um, understanding that CDK inhibitors and anti-estrogen therapies are the first line therapies, is there mm -hmm. any standard order for the next group of treatments that you might receive for hormone receptor sure. positive That's, disease. That is a great question. And the answer is not really, because that is so individual to a patient. So some things that we take in, that are taken into account in the management is like, uh, if a patient presented first time 
with metastatic breast cancer or had an early stage breast cancer and then had endocrine therapy for years and years as part of an early stage breast cancer treatment and then got metastatic disease. Um, and so those kinds of questions um, really are important um, and really speak to the need to individualize how uh, how people kind of cycle through. Um, you know, other things that are that come into play are, you know, again, I mentioned if there's ever a need for chemotherapy there because of, you know, what's going on um, in organs, um, tolerance, how people tolerate the drugs. Um, is taken into account when we think about sequencing. So aside from the fact that, you know, PICRE and um, Affinitor are definitely second line therapies, you know, once you kind of get past that first line, it really is, you know, so much that needs to be taken into account for each patient. Great. Thanks for answering that question. Sure. And we also have a number of people asking in different ways about how long, what's the average amount of time that CDK inhibitors tend to control the cancer? Um, yeah, so it is um, the average amount of time in terms of progression-free survival, I believe, and I will check quickly right now, um, is in the order of around 13 months from um, clinical trial. Um, I will say that um, in practice, you know, it's, we, we think of patients in terms of years with this, <laughs> uh, you know, like really that, um, people have well-controlled and stable disease for months and months and months. So that has been, you know, really, um, good to see, um, and really a success, um, in terms of breast cancer treatment. Absolutely. Thank you. So another follow-up to that mm -hmm. is um, if someone has a progression while taking a CDK inhibitor, maybe goes mm -hmm. off, goes on chemotherapy, is it possible to take a CDK inhibitor again? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't know the answer yet um, because they are so new, right? And so we don't have answers from trials yet on um, is there um, potential benefit once you have progressed? Um, that is an active question. Um, right now, you know, in the general strategy would be not to repeat um, because we don't have uh, the data yet for that. Okay. But Thank it is an active you. question that we think about. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, we definitely yeah. hear this particular question. We we do hear a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Another question is if you can you please speak to um, lowering the dosage of CDK inhibitors? There's a couple of different questions. One yeah. person um, is having diarrhea and, and so it's being suggested that they get a decrease. Another person yeah. has another side effect. So yeah. what do we know about what happens with the effectiveness yeah. and yeah, great question. Um, you know, it, it's like pretty much everything that we we use for cancer is uh, you is going to depend on how the patient tolerates it, and we do have room to decrease the dose. Um, I don't think that anyone should be nervous about doing that because um, if we could find um, a dose that you tolerate it well, um, and then you still benefit from the drug, that is that's the goal, right? And so it is common, um, you know, to start to decrease doses if needed um, to help patients tolerate, tolerate the treatments. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it's okay. <laughs> okay. It, I know sometimes um, it, it can go both ways. Um, and I think it just depends on the patient. Some patients are very nervous to drop the dose at all. Um, and then other people are like, take this, take it. <laughs> I don't want to take it at all. Right. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, if the dose is dropped, you don't, um, it's not like you lose the um, ability to respond again. You know, it's not like you progressed because you no longer 
you know, because your cancer is developed resistance mechanisms, it's, you need a higher dose. And then that's an, that's a decision that can be made with the physician. Like, do you go back up and how you manage the side effects, you know? Exactly. Thank you. And are CDK inhibitors associated at all with hair loss? We have someone who has given a pamphlet on hair loss, but um, she had been on another CDK inhibitor and was not given information on hair loss. Yeah. You know what? I've seen a few reports um, about thinning. Um, and certainly a few patients have said that. Um with it, it's not uh, like a common side effect, you know, that would be um, probably said when you start it, uh, but a few anecdotal reports. Okay, thank you. Yes, we've, we have heard that as well. Um, yeah. So another good question is someone is asking if you can talk a little bit about the sort of the ranges of positivity in hormone receptor oh, yes. positive breast cancer question. and whether yeah. that makes a difference. It does. And that's a great question. Um, and so, yes, ranges. Um, defining a cancer as ER positive has actually changed. That's changed too since I started, <laughs> uh, which is crazy to think about. But um, use, when I started training, um, the ER had to be at least 10%. The ER or the PR had to be 10% to be considered an ER positive cancer. Now, uh, 1% is the cutoff. We know that there's a higher chance of responding to endocrine maneuvers um, in higher um, expressions of uh, ER, PR positive. And so, you know, that expression could be anywhere from 1% to 100, <laughs> and, you know, and, and I've seen it, seen all of it, um, to be honest. In the metastatic setting, um, you can start the treatment, right, and then scan and, you know, follow two markers. And so we can see if you're having a response or not. Um, it becomes questionable or a little bit more difficult in the adjuvant setting, and I know this is a metastatic conference, but since we're talking about it, um, you know, in the adjuvant setting where you don't have, you know, tumor, there's a lot of debate about who benefits, you know, based on how strongly, um, you know, how strong the ER staining is, or the PR staining is. Um, but in the metastatic setting, yeah, you would start um, the treatment and then follow along and see how the response is, but it does, it does make a difference. Yeah. Okay. And another question is if you start out uh, ER positive, PR mm -hmm. positive, but then mm -hmm. the cancer loses its positivity for the estrogen receptor, can you still take anti-estrogen therapies for the PR positive, positive part of the cancer? Um, so let me understand the question. You said uh, starts off as ER, PR positive and then loses ER, but it's still PR positive. That's correct. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that case, yes, you could continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, another question. We had someone who, um, as we know, breast cancer can grow in the ducts as well as the lobules of the breast. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this person has lobular ER, mm -hmm. PR positive disease. Are there, sure. are the treatments any different when you have lobular metastatic disease? No, no, they're not. But we are learning more about how lobular behaves. Um, and again, it looks different. And this, this, you know, impacts from early stage into metastatic. It looks different on um, screening. Um it may not respond as well to chemotherapy um, in the lobular cancers when you're talking about sort of earlier stage patients. But in terms of what we do right now, there's not a difference. No. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go to the next question. Um, we have someone with bone mats and, and is saying that in and bone metastases, it can sometimes be challenging to do biopsy. Absolutely. Oh, goodness. Yes. Absolutely. Um, yes. 
So she's asking whether it's possible to test for things like mTOR um, using blood biopsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's a great question. Something else that is now available to us. Um, and yeah, that is definitely something that your physician will probably bring up <laughs> um, or you can bring up um, is having that uh, those kind of blood based tests for certain drugs. One thing I, I will mention since we brought up bone mess, this is a great question, um, is, you know, ER positive breast cancer tends to go to bone. Um, so that is, you know, very common, probably most commonly goes to bone. And the thing about um, doing a bone biopsy is sometimes the, the hormone receptor is inaccurate because of... Um, once you take the biopsy from the bone, it has to be decalcified so that it can be read, right? So they it has to sit around. I don't know what they do. I'm not a pathologist, but it, it sits around and, um, you know, so to get rid of the calcium so that they can read it. And, you know, sometimes that can show up as an ER negative um, result. So bone only disease can be tricky for many reasons, it can be tricky to get tumor from it, but also um, the hormone receptors can be inaccurate. So sometimes you might have someone who actually has an ER negative breast cancer, or ER negative that is bone only, and maybe their doctor is saying, uh, you know, you're behaving like an ER positive and like that's how we're treating you, which is valid. So a lot of uh, expression uh, of medicine being an art. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? That expression of medicine being an art and not just a science. Yeah. Um, to select for people's individual situations yeah. and the way their cancer is behaving. Yeah. Um, so a number of people had some follow-up questions to your comments about using tumor markers and um, mm -hmm. just wanting to know a little bit more about um, how often um, they should be used. and. Um, and also whether whether it's um, optimal to use tumor marker testing versus using scans to, to yep. check the progression. Great question. So um, the the treatment course um, should not be, in my opinion, dictated by only a tumor marker. Um, and I think um, the NCCN guidelines um, also echo that. Um, it Dr. Really Avery, is, I'm sorry, could you briefly explain what a tumor marker is? Because a oh, couple sure. people are yeah, yeah. That. It's a measurement of a protein in the blood that is made by cancer cells. And so, you know, you can get a, it's a blood test, you would get a number, let's say it starts off at 100, let's just say. Um, and then that can be followed um, with uh, over time as you're treated and you want to see if the tumor marker goes down, you know, that generally means that the cancer is not making as much of it and that, you know, the treatment is working or if it's going up, it could mean that um, the cancer is, you know, growing uh, more than you would like and that the treatment isn't working, right? But I will say that, um, so again, it's not a test to, to change to base anything on um, by itself. It is a piece of a picture. The rest of the picture are your scans and clinically how you're doing. I mean, you know, this is, um, we're talking about how we're managing disease. It is about um, getting control of the cancer. It's about you living your life, doing the things that are important to you um, and all of those things combined. And so tumor markers are not, um, reliable enough by themselves to say, your scans look great, you feel good, you know, but we're going to change everything because of this, you know? And so the other thing is once you get to know a particular patient, um, it varies. Like some people, um, the cancer that they have doesn't make much in terms of tumor marker. Some people, it does. And so, you know, it is something that, again, is individualized um, and something to discuss with, with your doctor on, like, where are my tumor markers and how are we going to use them? But 
I would say not to um, expect that any decision will be made just singularly based on that. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. That's yeah, very yeah. helpful. Someone asked like how often they should be checking all that. Again, it's very individual. Cause like I said, sometimes, you know, a patient's particular cancer doesn't make much and we don't check them. <laughs> sometimes, you know, someone uh, does make a lot and then we use them and then we decide how often depending on how the treatment course is going. And, you know, for ER positive breast cancers, we talked about the disease can be well controlled for a really long time. So there's nothing to say, oh, everyone needs to have this every, you know, three months or something. So it sounds like it's very really important to have a conversation with your doctor and be able to ask questions about why and when to have yes. these tests. And how they'll be used um, in determining, you know, the treatment course. Yeah. Sure. So there's a few questions here about, you had talked a little bit about the the new oral Fazlodex medication that's being developed. Can you uh, explain, first of all, what a CERD is, and then sure. we'll talk a little bit more about that the trials around that particular drug and, and when it might be available? So, yeah, the um, so a CERD stands for a Selective Estrogen Receptor Degrader. Um, it is um, a class of drugs that is what it sounds like attacks the estrogen receptor. Um, the fulvestrant was the first. Um, the emerald trial was the trial that was uh, completed and reported out. Um, and that is an oral CERD uh, that was, uh, again, in you know patients who had had other treatments. I do not know. Well, I don't know if where they are in the FDA approval process. It is not FDA approved. Uh, you know, of course, that once a trial is completed, then they go to the FDA to, um, you know, to submit the application, et cetera. Um, and so I don't know where they are in the process of FDA submission um, and approval. So I can't speak to anything about like when it would be available. However, this is where, um, uh, you know, clinical trial participation <laughs> and awareness becomes uh, very important because, again, clinical trials move the the whole um, field forward. But also, um, in the drugs that work and change standard of care, uh, the patients who are participating in trial get access to them much earlier, right? Then they become approved and kind of you know, available for, for everyone. Thanks for saying that, Dr. Avery. Sure. So the next question um, is from someone who started out with bone mets and, um, and now the, the cancer has spread to soft tissues to the liver, um, mm -hmm. was able to get genomic testing and may be eligible for immunotherapy options, but is still ER positive. So what are, for people who might have ER positive disease that might be eligible for immunotherapies, are there options that are optimal for them? What do we know about immunotherapy and ER positive metastatic disease? Yeah, that's a good question. So right now, um, the approvals for immunotherapy are in um, triple negative breast cancer. And that is, my slide actually had Pembro, but that lost its approval. It's a tezaluzumab now <laughs> only. Um, and so, yeah, so, so far there's not... Um, you know, any approval for immunotherapy in the ER positive breast cancer. I would say uh, probably again, and this is, a, this is a discussion with their physician on um, things that we take into account um, in terms of considering when to switch a patient from like an endocrine dictated pathway to like something else whether it's chemotherapy or in this case, like an immunotherapy, maybe from a clinical trial situation or something. Um, one thing that becomes important is like how long a patient responded to um, a hormone-based regimen, um, how long or how short that was, you know, where the progression was. I think this person said it was in the liver. 
Um, and so there's a lot to consider in terms of when you would then say, instead of continuing down the route, if you will, of endocrine directed therapies, we're going to change course right, to a chemotherapy or maybe even look for an immunotherapy option because of genomic testing, um, really has to take into account just kind of how the whole um, treatment course is going. Does that make sense? I don't know if I answer the question now. I do that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I think you did. But I think, you I think the question you. was, are there, do we know of any approved immunotherapy options in ER positive breast cancer at the moment? And the answer to that is no. But um, another thing to think about in terms of targeted therapies is um, BRCA. And so I put I, that, that was on a slide, but um, if a person has uh, BRCA, uh, mutated breast cancer, which is ER positive, they, there is an approved option, um, which is PARP inhibitor in that scenario. Thanks, Dr. Avery. Well, I have to give you your last question. Unfortunately, this has been the fastest hour. Um, oh, is it up? It, oh, it's it almost up. up. But I, I do want to ask one last question, which is um, just knowing the clinical trials going down the road, what is the research that most excites you in, in hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer that you could see um, arriving for people in the next few years? Yeah, it's it's the oral surd. Um, you know, from, from the Emerald trial, it's that. Um, and also, you know, I mentioned there's an uh, antibody drug conjugate. Well, I didn't say it was an antibody drug conjugate, but there is a drug called um, Sazituzumab, which is uh, right now um, uh, approved for triple negative breast cancer, but it is something called an antibody drug conjugate, which means that um, it is a chemotherapy which is tied to a target, um, and the target is called trope two. Um, and so, what it does is um, binds to that receptor on cancer cells, but then delivers chemotherapy um, to it. And the reason that that's exciting is because you know that drug, that class of drugs, was uh, first um, used in breast cancer in the HER2 positive population. So Ketsila is one, you know, where they kind of married a chemotherapy to a HER2 target. Um, and now we have this one, which is in triple negative, but again, trials in ER positive. And so, um, you know, that would open up like another class of drugs, um, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs>